Hello, welcome to Pressure Point. My name is Valerie Dudeward. Our topic this program is the residential school experience and we're going to be talking to some people who have endured experiences in residential schools and we're going to be talking a bit later with two guests who have collaborated on a very interesting uh, piece of work that they have brought to the church and other audiences. I'd like to welcome my first guest for this program, Harriet Nahini. Welcome to Pressure Point. Actually, my name is Zubayat. That's and my real name. What language is that? Uh, in? That's um, West Coast. Uh, my name is Zubayat from the house of Kwistuk of Pachida. Thank you. People of the Seafoam. Thank you. We were talking about residential schools, and I had mentioned to you that my mother had briefly attended a residential school, a different one from the one that you went to, and that every person who's gone through residential school or mission school has different experiences around that. And you said something really interesting to me that, that I'd like to ask you about. You said, I'm still bitter and I'm still healing. And for some people, knowing that you had left residential school in Port Alberni 45 years ago might be difficult for some people to understand the impact that still has in your life. Not only in my life, but my children's lives, my grandchildren's lives, and, my, and six generations from now will, will feel the effect of what we went through in residential school. <clears throat> the violence, the, um, the, uh, the verbal abuse, uh, humiliation. Our culture is our backbone. And they took that away from us in residential school. Our culture was taken from us and we were sent out um, learning how to speak English and trying to fit into a society that did not want us. Right, right. to this day, they still don't want us. And you mean the mainstream The mainstream society. society. They still taunt uh, my grandchildren at, uh, at the swimming pool anywhere, you know, in school. Prejudice is still there and it apparently it always will. And we, we have to teach our children how to survive that. How did you survive? And also, did it take a while for your memories to surface of what you really experienced? Quite a while. Um, we, we survived. Um, I was with a, a group of my, my cousins. Um, and we survived by laughing, by just having fun. Uh, of course, we were punished for laughing as well. Uh, right to this day, we laugh about how we used to line up and they used to use an oil can to squirt cod liver oil into our mouths. <laughs> they used to use an oil can. <laughs> And this was your uh -huh. I mean, vitamin yeah, a day, uh -huh. keeps the doctor uh -huh. away. What do you mean I when mean, uh, you said how that you were punished? Inhuman, eh, to be? <laughs> yeah, so it's like an assembly line, uh -huh. I guess. Yeah. When you said that you were punished for laughing, can you tell me what you mean by that? Well, there's 300 people in the room, you know, and uh, some are laughing and others can't hear what's going on, so we were punished for laughing. What would happen to you? Um, usually a strap on the hand or, you know. And when you went there, you were about 10 years old? 10. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, did you speak English as well as your language? Uh, I spoke um, some English. I, I spoke, uh, I was away uh, for five years from my mother to uh, uh, Zabalas, uh, Ahauzit. So I, I had an accent from up north, up 
Upper Island. You know, I, I spoke some of their words. And, uh, well, the, um, I looked forward to learning English. I, I looked forward to learning, to learning uh, math, English. You know, I, I looked forward to it. I, I thought it was going to be really great. And um, I, I guess it was, you know, it helped me survive out here. Uh, it was the way they did it that, you know, the humiliation. I guess people hear this, but it's hard to really understand unless you can say For one exactly thing, we something. were not really meant to be educated. They did not bring us there to be educated. They, uh, they uh, brought us there to, uh, to be domestics. They, it was an industrial school. They wanted us to go out there and, and uh, be domestics. So we were taught servitude. We were not, you know, we were not really, yeah. You know, for one thing, uh, you, you, uh, they were, you, you left when you were either 16 or uh, grade eight, or reached grade eight, whichever came first. What if you wanted to go to grade 12 or at 13? The at the, the time that I went, we had no opportunity. But the kids after, after me, you know, uh, they had the opportunity. We didn't have that opportunity. So uh, I was, a, I uh, labored all my life, and so I'm still bitter. Of course I'm bitter. You know, I, I didn't have the same opportunities as, you know, everybody else. I did not. I was brought there to be, to be taught to be a domestic. And that's what I was all my life. All my life I labored. You know? Uh, Who do you feel angry at today? Because I hear so much, <laughs> I hear so much yeah, anger. Yeah, uh-huh. The church, the church that brought me there, the government who forced my mother to bring me there. It was either uh, bring me there or she would go to jail. You know, that's the way it was. Um, because this was a law. It was a law, uh-huh. Um, I'm bitter, I guess, pretty well, just plain bitter, you know? And, and uh, I've tried to get over that. You know, I, I've tried, but uh, there's just too much. Could I Be ask because, what you could I ask what you've done to, to uh, try to get over it or to face some of the feelings you have? Uh, I'm, I went back to my culture. You know, I, I, I always have been there, really. But I just uh, uh, put a name to it. You know, we were, we were, um, we were taught to uh, give and not to take. And that's what I've done all my life, is give, 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 give. Uh, that's our culture. Um, I've remembered songs, prayers. That's helped me. I've gone to a psychiatrist. That's helped me. <laughs> and uh, But it doesn't really, you know, doesn't really work. Do you feel your life is forever changed because oh, of what of happened course. 50 of years course, of course, because you see, um, my mother never hit me. I went to residential school. I had children. I hit my children. My children hit their children, and their children hit their children. You know, that that's the legacy of residential school. Our um, our prisons are filled with people like me that are bitter, who didn't know how to handle it, and ended up in prison. Skid Row is uh, a monument to what the uh, churches and the government did to us. That's why I'm so bitter. I see it all the time. 
In, I believe it was 1986, the United Church of Canada, as well as some other churches, uh, joined to make an apology to the First Nations people of Canada. And then last spring, the United Church of Canada started a fund for healing, uh, especially around the residential school experience. Mm -hmm. What other things would you like to see happen? The, re the, um, the churches and the government and everyone, that, uh, they, they took our ad artifacts from our villages. I'd like to see some of that returned. For one thing, I'd like my sons to make uh, their, uh, uh, um, their regalia, but we don't know what it looks like. Where are these Wouldn't pieces? Wouldn't it be great if some of those people that bought our regalia gave it back to us or at least brought it somewhere where we could look at it? That's one of the things they could do, mm. is track down. A lot of it is, uh, you know, in private collections. So these were sold, taken from Yeah, taken the from people. our villages, uh, taken, or, or uh, we were broken people, some were drinking, and, and sold their regalia. You know, it, it went in all different ways. Whichever way it went, it should come back. There's no way they can return our culture. We do, our culture is uh, our spine. And we need to regain that spine. There's no way they can, re, re, they can give it. They took our culture away from us, but they can't give it back to us. Can anybody give that back no. to us? No, no. Uh, you see, the people who remember the culture are still in church. They were the ones that they were brainwashed. Elders, I'm an elder. Uh, I sing my songs to my children or anyone else who would listen. But there are elders out there who know their culture, but they're in church, you know. They, 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 they're brainwashed. They're, they were taught that it isn't, that this is heathen, and they, they go to church, and then when the young people want to know what their culture is and go to those elders, they won't tell them. They won't show them, because they're stuck in that church, and they're, they're going to be gone soon. They, you know, it'll die with them. So you Find a way to uh, unbrainwash those people. That, that would be nice. Or maybe find a way for them to find a way to be accessible to young people. Do you find that young people have a, have a hunger? Oh, yes, they do. They do. You know, I, I've heard so many times uh, young people say they, you know, they ask the elders to come and talk to them. You see what, what happened? was uh, the potlatching was outlawed. The potlatching was where everything happened. All the ceremonies, the coming of age ceremonies, when the girls ha uh, became young ladies, they, they were, all women came to them and taught them, told them how they should conduct the rest of their lives. All that ceremony was outlawed and it's all gone. Although I, you know, I still practice it. My, and for the boys, when their when their voice changed, the the men came to equip them with uh, knives, and and, and uh, taught how to how they should take care of their family. They were taught a role. They were taught um, how they should conduct the rest of their lives. That's gone. You see. Our culture, that's what I mean about our culture, it's gone. E even with people like me who, who say, oh yeah, I, you know, I still practice my culture, and I do. I invite people to come and witness my culture. 
uh, a couple of, a few months ago, I had a, 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 a potlatch for my, my grandsons whose voice changed, you know, and they loved it. You know, people, there were very few people, it was right in my house, because that's where it went when it was outlawed. When it didn't happen out. in big houses anymore. It happened in homes, yes. small homes. So the ceremony is still So the there. ceremony is still there, but who, you know, the, just a small group of people are witnessing it, my family and a few other people. This has uh, been such a pleasure for me to speak with you. Thank you very much for appearing on Pressure Point, this program, and we'll return in a moment with our second segment. Welcome to the second segment of Pressure Point. My guests in this segment are Larry Loy and Trude Hubner. And I guess in the spirit of Harriet Nahaney, who was the first guest in the program, are there other names that, that you are known by? <clears throat> yes, my Cree name is Oskinego. I was given this name when I was three years old in Alberta. And Trude? Oh, you mean my German name is Gertrude? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy with Trude. Trude. The two of you uh, met uh, a couple of years ago, yes. and uh, Larry has written a play that's the centerpiece of what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'd like to uh, hear how the two of you met. Uh, Bob Sardi, a mutual friend, um, had given my name to Trude about reading some of my work in her church. I believe that was the first time that we got together. And uh, then from there we went to, we were in the same class with uh, John Gray. And I was telling her about the play and we got talking. The more we talked about it, the more we got into it. And it just took off with Trude and I. But mostly with Trude. Uh, a lot of work on her part. What, uh, what eventually happened in terms of uh, bringing the play within the physicality of, of the church that you were attending? Well, at South Hill I was on the Mission and Service Committee and felt very strongly that we should look at where the M&S dollars are going in Vancouver. And that's? And that's First United in the area down there, which is what brought me to call someone, well, Bob, say, who do you know that's articulate and can speak in a church? And he gave me Larry's name. And when I saw Larry's writing, since I'm a writer myself, I knew immediately that we had some great talent here. And uh, I respected his writing. I did invite him to South Hill. After that, as Larry said, we did meet again at Simon Fraser. And then things just really took off. I, I said that we could present it. I told our committee at the church that we could present this and it would, be, um, it would fill the church, which is, of course, what everyone's looking for these days. And uh, with a lot of work from, from others in our congregation. And um, we brought Larry and the play with Constance directing and a, a full Native cast. And um, I just felt it was such a great piece of art and that Larry is so talented that we had to, we had to present it with absolutely no judgments. And I, I don't think that anyone needs to ask for any forgiveness or, or any of that. But we accept the United Church pol apology, but that wasn't a major part of it. It was really to acknowledge and respect the talent that Larry has. So your writing came about uh, a long time ago. Have you written most of your life? No, I just started writing about 1988, I guess. Uh, prior to that, I had family. So my time was geared to raising a family. And I never had a chance to write till I was handicapped. So that's when I started writing. Uh, really trying to get into writing 
going into English classes, taking a bit of grammar here and there. Everywhere I could get a, a bit of English, I took. And um, I was going to write a novel to begin with, and I thought that wasn't, wouldn't get my message across as well as a play would, and that's when the concept of the play began to form. And I chose to do a play instead of a novel. The um, name of the play is, or the names of the play, could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, when I was in residential school, I guess the, the basic and the most important thing for children to learn was the mass answers in Latin in order to be altar boys. And not only that, if you didn't learn the mass answers, you couldn't go to a movie. So that That's was a <laughs> so that was a, a plus. So if you learned Latin, then you got to go to movies. And the title, being that it was "Pray for Us," is what all churches are pray for the poor little children. And it never happened to us. So I thought, "Pray for us," being the title, it didn't sound good in English, but in Latin it sounds as great, or opera nobis. So hence the title, Pray For Us. And that's how the play began. Did you come through a, a movement, a process of change or reflection on your life before you wrote the play, while you were writing the play? Writing the play? I guess both. <clears throat> I had to, when I made a commitment to myself, I had to do it traditionally and physically. Physically, I had to get my body well and my mind also. So in order to do that, I had to quit the things I thought were fun, like booze, alcohol, parties, uh, I found that the more I took after what I wanted to do, the better I felt and more comfortable. I could sit and write and had no problems. Uh, I had uh, some of the scenes were quite hard for me. I had to go and do some traditional sweats in mission to complete three scenes that involved a sister character and the two priest scenes in the play. So it was hard in them three scenes. I had to go and do all this, the medicine wheel and mission to complete them three scenes. So yes, it's a, it's a continuing process for me. One thing that I'm interested in, Trude, is you made a statement that I, I think is really powerful and has a, a lot of meaning, which is the point of part of what what you were seeking to do and uh, so much of what people who are working within the church are seeking to do is to fill the churches or to bring about more people who will, who will actually enter the physicality of the churches to even begin being involved in some other activities. Is this something that you consciously wanted to do by um, not looking, say, to South America or Africa but looking within the, the community of greater Vancouver, say, that we live in? Very much so. Uh, it's a community church. We have to reach out into our own communities where we live. That's the only way that any uh, walk-to church is going to survive. It's the, the path of survival for the United Church, if that's what we're talking about. Also, I felt very strongly that uh, that we have to walk the walk. If there's an apology, then we offer our church space, the sanctuary, not the basement, but the actual sanctuary, to present this play and have people watch it. Uh, Janet Colley, our minister, was very good at ensuring that people, people from VST, Vancouver School of Theology, attended. We had student interns. We had a lot of people for pastoral care. We had elders. We respected. We had Buddhists at the door you know, as, as our ushers. Uh, it was 
completely collaborative and respectful of each person's faith following, whether it was a Christian following or not. And we all met. It happened to be our home. We happened to meet at our home this time. We'll meet at someone else's home next time. How can people, just before we uh, have to end the program, how can people access the play? How can people contact you and your team? They can contact me at home at 322-2858 and Larry, I think he's in writing mode. <laughs> I'll field the calls. That's generally what I do. And then I phone them and I get really excited and say, oh, God, Larry, this is what's going to be happening now. And uh, he either says yes or no. And uh, that's the best way to do it. Or come to South Hill and talk to us there. I'm there on most Sundays. I'm on the worship committee now. And uh, we've had a really good six to eight months. We've done our prison tour. We went to the federal prisons. Uh, through corrections. With this play? That with this play, with, with the native cast. We have a very strong message of clean and sober. And we ask all our actors to be clean and sober also. Larry Louis, Trude Hubner, thank you very much for joining me on this edition of Pressure Point. And also, I give my thanks to Harriet Nahaney. Once again, I'm Valerie Dudeward. This has been Pressure Point. Thank you for joining us. The preceding program was produced through the facilities of Rogers Community 4, Vancouver. We want to hear from you and invite you to leave your comments and suggestions on our 24-hour response line message machine. Please call 731-5812.